Right, I want you to glance at your watches, because I'm doing this in real time. Just a few seconds ago, we entered Monaco. There's the world-famous harbour, with all the expensive yachts. The Monte Carlo Casino and the Hotel de Paris, where Frank Sinatra used to lock swords with Errol Flynn. All around it lies France. But in just a few seconds, that's it. That was Monaco. It was literally as small as London's Hyde Park. But Monaco's always punched above its size. The last 50 years has been the most glamorous, the most star-studded, and the richest place on Earth. may be minuscule, but thanks to the Grand Prix, Grace Kelly, and the superstars who flock here, it's got a big reputation that's transformed it into a land where money is king. How much is this going to cost me? One million, one hundred thousand euros. So that view is worth about 30 million pounds. Yes. If I've got half a billion to spend, you're the man. Absolutely. <laughs> the place is crawling with millionaires, more in fact per square metre than anywhere else on the planet. There's probably 2,000 millionaires. And how many billionaires? 50. And most of them are lured here by its tax haven status. So who are these mega rich and how do they spend their time and their money? Do you use that jacuzzi, Mohammed? Yeah, sometimes. Not naked, I hope. Of course. <laughs> and just how many zeros do you need on your bank balance to live this lifestyle? You are really James Bond, aren't you? How the hell do I want to say that? <laughs> but does wealth equal happiness? Everybody believes in money like a kind of a religion. Yeah! And what about those who don't have quite so much spare change? I think a lot of people who are workers are being squeezed out. Monaco doesn't often open its doors to the cameras, but I've been given a unique opportunity to scratch beneath the surface and ask how this tiny limpet of land on France's underbelly, from, from seaside resort for idle aristocrats to playground paradise for the absurdly affluent. If you're a rich Brit with cash to spend and taxes to avoid, then Monaco is definitely for you. After all, why don't the British government get their filthy paws in your hard-earned cash when you just splash it all out on flash cars, helicopters and big yachts? They don't just have millionaires in Monaco, they have billionaires, and lots of them. Like Sir Philip Green, the British high street king. He lives with his wife Tina around the corner here. They're so rich that they lend their private helicopter to Prince Albert. And then there's that colourful character Stelios from EasyJet. He's worth a billion and lives just down there. And John Hargreaves, the boss of Matalan, worth about half a billion. What might surprise you is they don't live in huge sprawling country homes or palatial villas. No big gardens here. There's simply no room in Monaco. They all live in relatively small apartments, the kind of thing that, to be honest, you might turn your nose up at. Why are these multimillionaires prepared to slum it in a seafront shoebox? Well, a Monaco address goes hand in hand with qualifying for tax-free status, something the rich rather like, because it means they get richer. Consequently, they're literally queuing up to get in. Of course, that means that property here hasn't exactly been rocked by the credit crunch. So just how much do you need to fork out for a quality pad if you're one of the big players? These are the... what we're going to see. King of real estate, Michel Dotter, is taking me to see a little something in the primest of prime locations. But stay watching, because its price tag might make your eyes water. So here we are, we're in one of Monaco's best apartments. How many rooms does this apartment have? OK, this flat has a big living room, dining room, four bedrooms. So we go upstairs? Yeah, if you want, okay. yeah, with pleasure. 
What makes this place unusual is that it has two levels and offers something that in Monaco is harder to find than a copy of Socialist Worker, outside space. I mean, what a view. This has to be the best view of Monaco, Michel. Yes, this is the best view of Monaco because you are facing the palace and you are uh, directed to the south, mm -hmm. which means then you got sun from early morning until the end of the day with the mountain. And when the Grand Prix is on, you, you can just stand and watch the cars go? Yes, you can see the Formula One Grand Prix is seated in your rocking chair and have a drink <laughs> a cup of champagne. <laughs> Let's cut to the quick here, Michel. How much, if this apartment went on the, on the market tomorrow, how uh, much would it be worth? It would be roughly 60 million pounds. For a four bedroom duplex? For a four bedroom duplex. How much of that 60 million for this property is the view, would you say? I would say more than 50, 55%. So that view is worth about 30 million pounds? Yes, that's right, <laughs> good. That's an expensive view. Is it expensive view? Is uh, what the people they like to have here. Luckily, it's rarely cloudy, and with average prices of £40,000 per square metre, it's the most expensive place to live in the world. Clearly, there's no financial meltdown here. Smack bang in the centre of Monaco is the most famous area, Monte Carlo, home since the early 1900s to the legendary Monte Carlo Casino and the Hotel de Paris. Five star, of course. It's a place to see and be seen. But naturally, it's here that I headed to have lunch with expat millionaire Mike Pegram. And here we come if you're going to lunch at the Hotel de Paris. Eight years ago, Mike sold his chemical business in England for £44 million. He then up sticks to Monaco, thus saving himself capital gains tax of around 13 million quid. And that's what you call a shrewd move. It is impossibly glamorous here. There's been Rolls Royces, Ferraris, Aston Martins, Lamborghinis. Yes. <laughs> it just takes a little getting used to. I think you'd, you'd get into the swing. I feel you'd be quite natural down here. <laughs> I think I'd love it. If you fancy Mike's lifestyle, then make a fortune. Become resident in Monaco, spend less than 90 days a year in the UK, and bingo, your tax bill is zero. It's what the 2,000 Brits here might call don't pay as you earn. Do you think that it is a very glamorous place, or do you think that's slightly overdone, the glamour of it all? Well, one of the things I say about Monaco is anything that money buys, Monaco delivers very well. Whether it's five-star hotels, restaurants, we've got a very nice cultural life as well. I'm a friend of the opera, a friend of the orchestra. On the other hand, in the last three weeks, I've been to Diana Ross, Celine Dion and Katie Mellon. I suppose it does make being exiled in a self-imposed tax prison slightly more bearable. What's more, do a five-year stretch in Monaco and you're then free to return to the UK, keeping all that tax that you've saved. Mike loved it so much, though, that he stayed on. In many ways, you epitomise the glamour of the Englishman who's come to live in Monaco. The Aston Martin, your debonair, you wine and dine in the fancy restaurants. I mean, you are really... James Bond, aren't you? How the hell do I answer that? <laughs> <laughs> I but... could tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. <laughs> OK? <laughs> well, the point I was going to make was that it does seem to me, if you want to be in, in the game, if you want to wine and dine with people like yourself, you want to go to the casino, you want to go to the big shows, you've got to be fairly seriously well off, I would say. Comfortable. I think you need to be comfortable. But what would you think you'd need to really be a good cushion? 10 million? Yes, I think you probably could manage on that if you exclude the money you've got tied up in property. 10 million should get you by. Yeah, yeah. Adequately, then. Comfortably. <laughs> with the odd, odd highlights now and again. <laughs> Tragically, I don't have that kind of money. But coming up, I'll find out what it costs to join the yachting set. I always say to people never spend more than 10% of your net worth on buying a yacht. Now, the pace of life in Monaco is changing fast. A few too many parked cars to decide. <laughs> and I'll get the business lowdown from a real dragon. There has to be a price for being successful, Piers. And maybe Monaco is the prize. So, Monaco's a tax haven with more millionaires per square metre than anywhere else in the world. And in the planet's most expensive property market, a room with a view will set you back an arm, a leg and most of your torso. 
How did this pocket-sized principality get to be such a big player? And when no one bats an eyelid at 10 million, just how much cash do you need to stand out in the crowd? The crucial thing about yachts is that size really does matter. That's about a 55-metre yacht, pretty big, pretty imposing. That's a bit bigger, bad girl. 60-odd metres, I would say. But in all honesty, that's not a yacht. That is a yacht. At 105 metres, Lady Mora dominates the harbour. And when she was built for a Saudi businessman in 1990, she was the biggest yacht in the world. Today, she's worth £250 million. It's what you might call a floating asset. Does size really matter? It only matters up to the point that you might want to have something a bit bigger than your next-door neighbour. And, of course, the annoying thing is if your next-door neighbour builds something bigger, then you've got to build another one. <laughs> and does that go on? It certainly does. I mean, the average... Nick Edmiston, known locally as Mr Yacht, is the leading boat broker in town. He's your man if you're after something nautical but nice. This harbour is astonishing. I like some of the more expensive high-end propositions that we've got well, here. The big boat coming into the harbour right now, the new cost of a boat like that today is between, say, 40 and 45 million euros. Really? I always say to people, never spend more than 10% of your net worth on buying a yacht. So you should be worth a lot of money to buy one of those, 400 you, million? Yeah, we do, you know, it, yeah, say half a billion is an easy round figure. So if I've got half a billion to spend, you're the man? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> or you've got more to spend. And as the credit crunch bites around the world, is there much sign of it in Monaco Harbour? I think the honest answer is no, at the moment there's not. I mean, I think it would be foolish for me to say that there will never be any sign of it, but, you know, even if you look back into the 1930s, in the height of the recession there, rich people were spending a lot of money, and the fact is the rich like spending money when other people are not spending it. To be in the game where I come in and blow everybody away in this harbour, what do I need to bring to you? Let's start you off maybe a very nice second-hand yacht, budget of, let's no, say... No, 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 hang on. I, I want brand spanking new. I thought you were. And I don't I want to be see. the second or third biggest. No. I want to be the big boy. Right. I want to be the whale of this Well, harbor. if you want to be the whale, then I think you should be looking at a budget of well in excess of 100 million today. I think we could make you respectable for about 50 million. I've never had any desire to be respectable, Nick. Let's just get the wallet out and talk, talk some big yachts. Come on, <laughs> how are we going? <laughs> Perched on a rock overlooking Monaco is the home of its greatest asset, the royal family. The Grimaldis have ruled here pretty much continuously since they seized the fortress over 700 years ago. 650 of those years were spent in relative anonymity, but in 1956, the then ruler, Prince Rainier III, married Hollywood movie star Grace Kelly in a fairy tale wedding that was watched around the world by 30 million viewers. It was the PR coup of the century. Overnight, the golden age of Monaco took off and it went from obscurity to a brand that became synonymous with glamour and elegance. Grace gave Monaco the cachet that money just can't buy. It ended in tragedy 26 years later when the car that Grace was driving plunged down a cliff. But her legacy lives on through her children, princesses Caroline and Stephanie and the current ruler, Prince Albert. Albert, now 51, succeeded his father in 2005. His photo hangs in every public building, not because it's law, but because the people genuinely believe that he is the key to maintaining Monaco's future. If you want to try and understand the difference between Britain and Monaco, then look at two copies of newspapers today. One's the Daily Mail from back home, Knives, Why No Part of Britain is Safe, and then we turn to the local paper, the Nice Matin, Monaco edition, which has as its main story a couple of ballet stars. Page three is a series of pictures of glamorous yachts in the harbour. And my favourite story is on page five, a 94-year-old local resident who's gone hang gliding. And of course, there's always the weather report. Sunny for months. According to this, there is simply no crime at all in Monaco. And that's because security is absolutely paramount here. 
There's roughly one police officer for every 62 residents. And with hundreds of security cameras, it's CCTV heaven. And every single vehicle entering Monaco is scanned by computer to keep out the criminals. It's also spotlessly clean. The streets are scrubbed every morning. So after splashing out on a Versace gown and Jimmy Choo's, you can tool around town without fear of stepping in something untoward. I mean, what's the point of spending your billions on the best that money can buy if you can't show it off? This is just a typical jeweler's watch shop in Monaco. And to give you some idea of the extraordinary prices you get here, look at that watch at the top there. Nice sort of jewel-encrusted watch with a black strap. When I first saw that, I thought, oh, it looks pretty good. Maybe 1,000 euros, 2,000 maybe. If it was really expensive, 5,000 euros. Let me tell you what that watch actually costs. One million euros. The flash watches here are 10 a penny. Well, 10 a million, as are Ferraris and Lamborghinis. So what do I really need to get noticed in Monaco? So, Bruno, look, I want to buy a new car, and I need one that fits my personal brand. What would you suggest? Hello, I have one car for you. It's an exceptional car. Uh, it's a Bugatti Veyron. Exceptional is almost an understatement. The Bugatti Veyron has a top speed of 253 miles per hour and is the most expensive car in the world. But get this, there are six of them currently registered in the square mile of Monaco. I suppose, look, the real question, Bruno, is how much is this going to cost me? It's 1 million, 100,000 euro, without tax. What? <laughs> 1 million, 100,000 100, euro, without tax. Exactly. At the same price as the watch, the car suddenly looks a bit of a bargain. And you can't do me a discount? I know, no, sorry for this car. Uh, it's exceptional to have one car available in the market. Well, Bruno, yes. you got a deal. Sorry. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. <laughs> right, I've bought the best car, the best boat, the best watch and the best pad. I've spent £162 million pounds in the process, but it's all been worth it because now I'm the daddy. Or am I? One man who can put things into perspective is James Kahn of Dragon's Den. He's been coming here on business for over 10 years and recently invested in Avalus, a Monaco company that specialises in providing luxury travel for the mega wealthy. How competitive is it down here? Because you meet a very rich guy and he's got a billion in the bank and then Philip Green walks around the corner and he's got four billion. <laughs> so, I mean, the guy with a billion suddenly feels rather, rather cheap and poor. I think everything beyond 100 million peers is actually irrelevant. If you've got 100 million, there is only so much you can do. I mean, how many mobile phones can you carry? I mean, you say that, but take Roman Abramovich. Yeah. That's his boat there. Okay. And it's parked in Ez, round the corner from Monaco, because it's simply too big sure. to get into the harbour. Now, he's got three like that, and he's building an even bigger one, sure. the world's biggest yacht. And you can't help thinking that the only reason he's doing this to be top dog. Sure. That concept of competition exists amongst probably the world's 50 richest people. Yeah. And of course, at that level, it's about the biggest private plane, the biggest yacht, the biggest mansion. But I think for us mere mortals... For the mere 100 million <laughs> brackets. That's right. It's a different game. And remember, Piers, in Monaco, there's probably 2,000 millionaires. I mean, 2,000 millionaires is a reasonable number. And how many billionaires? I would say probably now 50. 50 billionaires? Yes, yeah, absolutely, no and doubt. 2,000 millionaires yeah. in yeah. a population of 35,000. Which is obscene. I suppose the last question I, I have for you is, having heard all this, how do I get to the 100 million? <laughs> <laughs> Someone well on his way to that 100 million mark is Miles Mordant, an ex-racing driver he came here six years ago. He made his fortune in marketing around Formula One and is one of those rapidly becoming the new face of Monaco. Very rapidly. A few too many parked cars at this time. <laughs> now, if we were driving along in your white Lamborghini in England, probably most people would look at you in your shades, looking fit and tanned and in your white shirt and think, tossing, to be perfectly honest with you, Miles. Over here, I've noticed as we drive around, it's a very different kind of non-envious 
environment, isn't it? It's one of the positive aspects of living down here. You can have a car that you like, you love driving, you enjoy it, and there's not some kind of horrendous envy from everyone. Yeah. Unlike some, though, Miles isn't here to spend, spend, spend. He's hoping to make, 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 and sees Monaco as one big business opportunity. It used to be elderly couples retiring here, and that's not what it is now. I mean, I, you know, I find the place stimulating. I think it's a real hotbed of entrepreneurs now. You know, a lot of the people you rub shoulders with, they're interesting guys. So, Miles, look, tell me where Monaco begins and ends here. It's probably actually about 60% of what you see there, so it's actually a strip along the left-hand side. So all the tall buildings you see are in Monaco, so that yeah. actually gives you a perfect line along the back. It then comes back in, so most of what's going on up the hill there, that's not actually Monaco. That's France. It's France. So that tall building towards the back is where Monaco ends? Yep. So if you rented a flat in that building, you could live five metres the other side of it and pay a tenth the price, but you wouldn't be looked after in the same way as a, a non-Monaco you know, Monaco resident. Re the safety. Have you ever seen a fight in a bar? No. There seems to be something about Monaco. I think when people come to Monaco, you know, they understand it just has this persona and people seem to raise their behaviour. They also have some interesting rules here. You can't walk around the streets of Monaco with no shirt on. So, I don't know, I think your mentality, things like that, if you nip them in the bud, they don't start, you know, and um, people always seem very, very well behaved and respectful. Monaco today does seem like utopia for those who can afford it, that is. But incredibly, back in the mid 19th century, the country was on its knees, one of the poorest places in Europe, a lot ropier than utopia. Its saviour was the building of the Monte Carlo Casino in 1863. Within just a few years, it was generating so much money. Monaco was able to abolish income tax. And there's further protection for the Monegasques, as those born and bred here are known. It's illegal for them to gamble in their own casino. Two perfect examples of how the house always wins. Inside, there are six exquisite gaming rooms. If you're a high roller and want to play in secret, there are plenty of private gambling dens behind mirror panels. John, how are you? I'm here to meet professional gambler John Duthie. Now, John, you have actually won a million pounds in one session, haven't you? Yeah. A stupid question. What does it feel like to win a million? Funny enough, when I won it, it didn't really strike me. And then suddenly, when it cleared my account, it, I just suddenly realised, you know, it's a, it's a very large sum of money. You know, you can take a lot of pressure off. But in the end, like all casinos, they win, right? Of course. I mean, that's the risk you take when you come into a casino. Obviously, you, you're a big gambler. You've been in Vegas, all the big hot spots. What does the Monte Carlo casino mean to all gamblers worldwide? Because it must still retain a slight magic to it. Well, it does, because this is really where it all started. Uh, you know, everything about Monaco is, is just luxury, you know. You just feel you're, that you're sitting in luxury. You know, everything, the chips, the, the personnel, the way you're treated, the, you know, outside. There's something very, very special about it, you know. It's, uh, it really is the mecca for gamblers. I love these chips. They're all very colourful and glamorous, and sort of, they look like nice little toys. And then, of course, you look at something like this, and that says... 200,000 euros. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I was to put that there, that is 200,000 euros. Yeah. OK, I've emptied all my piggy banks. It's time to try and find out what it's like to win millions. In front of me, I actually have chips to the value of a million euros. And I'm going to put the whole lot on again. red. It's double or nothing. <laughs> Two million in the bank. Get in there. Well done. Thank you very much, Philippe. <laughs> I'd uh, like my chips, please. On the surface, Monaco looks like a gamble that's more than paid off. But there are two sides to every story. And so, I'll be venturing into the less salubrious neighbourhoods. Other people's dirty washing and a building site. Personal space seems to be less important here. I mean, to put it mildly, I'll be asking if Monaco can cope with the influx of even more money. Certain nationalities coming in are prepared to pay any money to get an apartment. Stupid money. And I turn to the dark side. 
There's an awful lot of hookers here. Stay up into the wee hours and you'll find plenty going on in Monaco. At the Sass Cafe, rock singers, racing drivers and the odd Hollywood star or two all rub shoulders with the more one-of-the-mill millionaires as they party hard, fueled by firework and blaze bottles of vodka and champagne at £1,000 a pop. Just across the road at the main concert venue, Mick Hucknall of Simply Red is in town, performing a dinner show. It's all a far cry from his days on the grimy UK club scene. Mick's been coming here for the past 15 years and has something of an outsider's take on Monaco life. I met him at the adjoining Monte Carlo Bay Hotel. Well, I could never imagine you living here, Mick. Not my scene. I, I'm proud to say I've always been the British taxpayer. And uh, that's, that's just the, the way it is. It would be the total yeah. antithesis of everything you stand for. But I have, I have grown to sort of enjoy it in a kitsch kind of way, <laughs> you know. My favourite one is the, is the Jack Nicholson quote. Uh, I thought sums it up uh, pretty much better than anything, really. He just said it's got Alcatraz for the rich. <laughs> they should call it money, Carlo. <laughs> because everybody believes in money like a kind of a religion. And uh, it's, uh, it's a different world, completely different world. I mean, do you find it quite obscene, really, in, in, a, in a weird way, that it's just so money-centred here? I see it now as more kind of amusing. Now, now you're the funny rich side. as most of the inhabitants. Yeah, but I don't really... <laughs> yeah, I agree, yeah, yeah, it's true. Do you think people here are happy? Many of the people I've met, I would say absolutely not. Um, there's a lot of old guys here with very young girls, and, and if they're not hookers, they're, they're on a wage, or they're on what they might call an allowance, and they usually end up in the separation with an apartment and a car, and then they move on to the next guy, or as Jackie Mason might say, the next schmuck. <laughs> you know, so it's really, that's, that to me is kind of the rhythm of this place in a lot of ways. Of course there are perfectly respectable families here and everything like that, but I'd say there's, a, there's an awful lot of hookers here. <laughs> Monaco certainly fits the bill as a sinful party playground for the rich playboy millionaire. It's full of temptation and fast living. But I wondered, where does that leave the ex-wives that have been traded in for a younger model? Well, to my surprise, divorcees Lavinia and Judy have a refreshingly sanguine attitude to the way that things seem to work down here. What is the average day like for ladies like you in Monaco? What do you actually do all day? Eat grapes, sit on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Personally, I do quite a lot. Yeah. <laughs> both, we both work, yeah. actually. In normal circumstances, you'd both be tremendously good catches. But over here, let's be brutally frank about it, the older guy who may normally be very attracted to your charms has his head turned by this stream of young women from Russia and Eastern Europe and so on. Is that, is that what goes on here? Probably if I was a man, I'd do that too. Well, do you, you don't probably. blame them? Not really. I think if they're on their second or third shot, they probably want to go younger and younger. It's normal. But where is love in all this, Lavinia? I can't jump into their heads. Some of these girls are, are very, very educated people. Probably they're very entertaining as well, and they've got one life to lead. I'd probably want a rich young guy anyway. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting a feeling from either of you that you feel particularly like you're missing out here. No, certainly not, no. <laughs> if there is a lot of sex going on, it's going to have to be confined to pretty small bedrooms, because the main downside to life in Monaco is a lack of space. And with more millionaires than you can shake a stick at clamouring to get in, every inch is worth a fortune. Down there is Fonvier, the most exclusive part of Monaco, with its amazing apartments, its fabulous waterside restaurants, the obligatory luxury yachts. It's where David Coulthard lives, and the property and newspaper tycoons of Barclay Brothers. The most extraordinary part of Fonvier is that until the early 70s, that was all sea. It just didn't exist. By reclaiming more land, Monaco is hoping to create many more Fonviers in the future. But until they do, places to live are going to remain pretty hard to come by. Consequently, finding somewhere that's actually for sale is easier said than done. 
And that's why 70% of people in Monaco rent, including the likes of Shirley Bassey, Ringo Starr, and even Monaco's richest resident, Sir Philip Green. They all live in apartments that will set you back a tidy £25,000 a month. Much as I'd like to live next door to our shell, with prices like that, I wonder whether a starter flat at the lower end of the market would be the smarter option. Miles Mordant, our marketing millionaire, this time in his runaround car, took me to see something in a lesser part of town. Come on in. <laughs> Prepare yourself. Come on through to the lounge. <laughs> The view is sumptuous. I mean, uh, yeah, of all I mean, the views yeah. on, the, on the French Riviera, I think other per people's dirty washing and a building site. Personal space seems to be less important here. I mean, to put it mildly, <laughs> Miles is converting this studio into a one bed flat to make it more desirable. Here is your expansive kitchen, which I can almost touch the sides. How much are you asking for this? Uh, this is for sale for 1.5 million euros. You're joking? No. You're serious? I, yeah, and I, I think it'll actually go fairly quickly. 1.5 million euros? Yes. Over 1.2 million pounds? For? 47 square metres of luxury. Monaco is already the most expensive country in the world to live in. Add in Russian oligarchs heating up the property market and rent soaring, and you'll understand why the workers here on an average wage of just over £2,000 a month are starting to complain. Mr Brian moved to Monaco in the 1970s and set up his catering firm selling posh nosh to rich aristocrats. And no, they don't eat dogs. That's just Lulu. Someone like you, Brian, you're not a rich man, I guess, compared no. to most of the people who live in Monaco. You're what I would call one of the workers here. I'm a here. worker here. Are you being slowly squeezed out by all this new money? I think a lot of people who are workers are being squeezed out. 20 years ago, 25 years ago, workers lived in Monaco. Now they don't live in Monaco. They can't afford to. They can't afford to. Uh, because you've got certain nationalities coming in and prepared to pay any money to get an apartment. Stupid money. You could never afford to buy an apartment, or a worker could never afford to buy an apartment. So obviously they live over the border. That brings its repercussions in the sense that we get drowned with traffic at nine o'clock in the morning. You know, when I first came here, you didn't have a rush hour. Now you have a rush hour. Where do you think it'll go, Brian? In five, ten years, Monica? I just hope they don't get swamped by traffic and too many people, because that, to me, will take a lot of the charm away. A lot of the charm was based around the fact that it was, to a certain extent, a village atmosphere, that you could go down the road and you knew ten people as you walked down the road. The fact that you knew the local policeman. Uh, now, you don't get that situation. Consider this. Every day, 40,000 workers stream over the border from France into Monaco. A thousand tourists pop in to clog up the streets and the almost daily cruise ships dump 2,000 passengers a time via the sea route. Great for the economy, maybe, but there's no doubt that Monaco's character is feeling the strain. Forgo residency and that tax-free status and live just a stone's throw into France, and you'll get anywhere up to 10 times as much bang for your buck. Supermodel and Monaco resident, Teresa Maxova, took me to see a friend's house just 20 minutes from Monte Carlo. I bet you've got a huge family. They all have over there. Wow. Kids, dogs. Look at this. Now, this is my kind of place. Clearly, my charm and wit left her tongue-tied. Clean it up. Like, not <laughs> enough, you know? Don't worry, we'll forgive you. Look at this. Look there at the view. Yeah, you Look at the room. Them. You can swing a cat in here or a, or a supermodel. Well, you can play your cards, right? You can have kids. You can have, yeah. It's a bit early Animals. for that. We're learning for kids. We've only just met. <laughs> I mean, the choice is very simple to me. You either live in this, or you live in a tiny little box in Monaco in the heat, with no pool, no garden, probably no supermodel girlfriend for 60 million. <laughs> I'm doing the maths here, Teresa, and it's not good for Monaco, you know. I'm afraid. And the great thing about it is, if you have a problem with your computer, you've got the number two at Microsoft living next door. <laughs> This evening, I have a hot date with Teresa back in Monaco. Well, she's letting me tag along to an exhibition of photos by ex-Rolling Stone Bill Wyman, 
and is just one of an endless stream of mingling celebrity bashes and fundraisers that take place on a daily basis in Monaco. Right on the back there. Of course. If you look really yeah. close, you see Charlie just through. Yeah, yeah. Bill's in town to perform for Prince Albert at the annual Red Cross Ball, one of the events that last year helped Monaco raise an estimated £100 million for charity. Teresa uses the scene here to help raise money for the Teresa Maxova Foundation, her own children's charity back in the Czech Republic. So how much have you raised for your foundation so far in total? I don't know, €3 million. Euro. OK, it's a lot of money. Yeah. You've done very well. Yeah, trying, you know, trying to work my best. Really? It's very good. <laughs> it certainly is, though, to be fair, you can't get a more target-rich environment. Is this kind of event typical Monaco kind of thing? I think you get a lot of different events. You get art, you know, exhibitions. You get photography exhibition. I think there's a lot of little, little different things. Then, with no motorcade, fanfare, or 21-gun salute, Prince Albert turned up at our small gathering in a small shop on an ordinary street. It was remarkable to see how accessible he is. You certainly have an extraordinary society here. There's a lot of respect amongst the people towards each other. And you should be very proud of what you've achieved. I think your mother would be very proud of you. Do you feel that? It's always emotional to think back on, on the years with her and, and that uh, I'd like her to be proud of me right now. And I hope that she would be. Thank you very much. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you. Coming up, why do fast-living celebrities find living in Monaco so appealing? When I was taking that sort of party to London, you know, you spend a night with someone and before you know it, I'm on the front cover of the newspaper. And in search of billionaires, I get aboard the yacht where Dodie and Diana spent their last holiday. She was there basically 10 hours, 8 hours a day. <laughs> Some bathing. <laughs> The Monaco Grand Prix is the most glamorous motor race in the world, and David Coulthard has won it twice. They're quite aggressive on acceleration. Yeah, yeah, I like to look at it. When in Rome and all that. Use the horses, aren't yeah. <laughs> I mean, incredibly glamorous when you come through here. When you're in a racing car, it's just the ultimate glamorous Grand Prix. It's everything that a Grand Prix should be. The Grand Prix started in 1929, and as you can see, it was as glamorous then as it is now. OK, well, maybe not, but it was a long time ago. What is true is that it instantly captured the world's imagination, and today is broadcast to 100 million people. For Monaco's image, it's a marketing gem. I've got to sum the half of every tabloid newspaper, thank you, <laughs> for everything you did for us, um, because you were, you were perfect. You were the racing driver who liked spending money, partying, and lots of pretty girls. It was great. It was fantastic because you had the safety of, of being able to go out, enjoy yourself, enjoy all the trappings of success, but knowing that you were only one kilometre from your apartment if you needed to, to head home quickly, and uh, knowing that you weren't going to, to get into too much trouble. Whereas when I was taking that sort of party to London, you know, you spend a night with someone, you think you're nothing, nothing more of it, and then before you know it, I'm on the cover of the newspaper. <laughs> So here you are, very committed to the hairpin. I think we might actually get some squealing of the tyres here. That's very impressive, Pierce. Thought you were going to hit the van. <laughs> <laughs> were you getting a bit nervous? Then? I was. I thought, <laughs> I thought the van was in your blind spot. <laughs> Dave is now retired from Formula One and sees his future settled here, running his businesses, like his hotel. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's <laughs> a happen. He nearly hit my hotel, for God's sake. Although attracted mainly by the tax savings, David also came here for the privacy it affords. You see, in Monaco, the police operate a zero-tolerance policy on paparazzi, so he can do whatever he likes and no one will be any the wiser. Given that you know, racing drivers now are big celebrities worldwide, is it, is it quite nice to be able to live in relative anonymity here? Absolutely. It's totally unique. I've never seen anything like this anywhere in the world. There is no paparazzi. You know, I went to Saint-Tropez yesterday, and paparazzi everywhere. Now, you might say, well, there's going to be in Saint-Tropez. Well, why should there be? It, mm. it should just be another place where you can go and hang out and have mm. fun with your friends. Monaco, they're not here. Therein lies a conundrum. Anonymity won't do for the young, fame-hungry mob of up-and-coming 
A, B, C and D listers. They need the PAPs as much as the PAPs need them, and so are heading elsewhere. Monaco has lost its crown as the happening in place. The 24-hour non-stop celebrity drip-feed culture of today just doesn't fit here. I think this wall in the American bar of the Hotel de Paris sums up what's happened with Monaco. All these pictures were taken here. David Niven, Orson Welles, Errol Flynn, Marlena Dietrich, Peter Sellers, some of the biggest stars in entertainment history, all very refined and elegant and beautifully dressed. Monaco has changed because the nature of celebrity has changed. It's still got it, but it hasn't got that. So while the Paps are in Saint-Tropez shooting Paris Hilton and she accidentally goes out without any underwear on, here in Monaco, the only stars being captured on film are the cards. Time to find someone who's experienced both old and new Monaco. I didn't have to look far. Moored nearby in the harbour is the yacht that Diana and Dodie famously spent their last holiday on. And on board is equally famous and seriously wealthy owner, Mohamed Al Fayed. And circling us, the sailing boat that was once Dodie's pride and joy. Do you use that jacuzzi, Mohamed? Yeah, sometimes. Not naked, I hope. Of course. <laughs> You like to try? Not, not on camera, I don't know. We, we have I don't bikini, We have bikinis here. <laughs> so this is the big command yeah. desk, yes? Do you, ever, yeah. do you ever drive it yourself, Ahmed? Sometimes. Yeah? But it's very complicated, you know? <laughs> it's all electronics, it you is, know? It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And is he an easy boss to work for? Yes, fantastic. 25 years. Really? Yeah. You, you look all right, as though you're not too damaged by this experience. <laughs> We're on your boat. I've spent the entire week in Monaco trying yeah. to find a genuine, bona fide, stinking rich billionaire. And here you are. Thank you. What I didn't know about you yeah. was that Monaco is actually a very special place to you. Yeah. You've been here over 40 years. That's right. As it's... a resident and your boat's moored in the harbour. And in those early days, it was, it was impossibly glamorous. I mean, you had... Liz Taylor and Richard Burton used to moor their boat next to yours. Yeah. And you were, you were there, you were part of that absolutely, scene. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Grace Kelly was there with the Richard and uh, Elizabeth. What was she like, Grace Kelly? Spectacular woman, very human, down to earth, always laughing, great sense of humor. In many ways, the parallel yeah. with Grace Kelly and Monaco is very similar to the effect that yeah. Diana had on England. Both ended in tragedy, obviously, but you knew them both very unusually. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Grace Kelly, just very, very ordinary person. People loved her. Diana was, a, for me, is a saint, you know, just a spectacular woman again. God blessed her with so many hu humanity and uh, caring, and is a memory for me. When I come, I just still feel their soul still moving around the place. Diana loves Diana, jokes running everywhere, you know, and her favorite place is up there. She was there basically 10 hours, 8 hours a day. <laughs> Some bathing. Some bathing. <laughs> what do you think the future of Monaco is going to be, Mohammed? I think it will stay. It will stay forever. It's been here for a few hundred years. And then also for Prince Albert, you know, he's loved, he's cared by the people. They, no one will dare to do anything to that place because he's so popular, you know? He's incredibly popular. Yeah. Grace Kelly have put in her case. She loved him, she cared about him. She gave them a lot of principle in life. And she grew up with this quality which she have. And uh, it's a blessing for Monaco that she was here and married Prince René. It was tremendous. So what have I learned about Monaco? Well, it's very clean. There's no litter or graffiti. The sun always shines. There's little crime to speak of, and it's very private. But let's face it, the main reason that most people live here is to avoid paying tax. That kind of sticks in my gullet a bit, to be honest. I mean, after all, I pay tax, and so do most of you. But before I went back to the world of pollution, paparazzi, freezing rain and PAYE, this question still bugged me. So I turn once again to Dragon James Khan for the answer. There'll be lots of people watching this programme 
who will be thinking, these bastards, <laughs> why should they not pay any tax, like me? Well, let's be honest, Piers, the choice that they took is a choice that's available to everybody. Yeah, but James, come off it, look. It is not openly available to 95% of the British population to come out and live in Monaco. Apart from anything else, a croissant would break the bank. There has to be a price for being successful, Piers. You know, what's the point in working so hard all of your life if there isn't a prize at the end? And maybe Monaco is the prize. It is a pretty good prize, and for that reason, I'm in. Mm -hmm.